This is Space Time Series 19, Episode 86, for broadcast on the 2nd of December 2016. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You can download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast just about everywhere, including iTunes, Stitcher, Pocket Casts, Bytes.com, YouTube, SoundCloud, Audio Boom, and from Spacetime with Stuart Gary.com. The show is also broadcast coast to coast across the United States on Science 360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C. Coming up on Space Time, a record breaking satellite galaxy discovered orbiting the Milky Way, the new hypothesis challenging Einstein's speed of light physics, and the rock comet responsible for this month's spectacular Geminids meteor shower. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. The faintest satellite galaxy ever seen has been discovered orbiting our own Milky Way galaxy. The discovery, reported in the Astrophysical Journal, suggests the presence of a large number of undetected dwarf galaxies in the halo of the Milky Way and provides important insights into galaxy formation through the hierarchical assembly of dark matter. At the moment, astronomers have identified about 50 satellite dwarf galaxies orbiting the Milky Way. That's far less than the hundreds predicted by the cold dark matter hypothesis used to explain galaxy formation. The formation of galaxies like the Milky Way is thought to proceed through the hierarchical assembly of dark matter forming dark halos and then through the subsequent infalling of gas and star formation affected by gravity. Standard models of galaxy formation in the context of the so-called cold dark matter hypothesis predict the presence of hundreds of small dark halos orbiting a Milky Way-sized dark halo and a comparable number of luminous satellite companions. However, with only around 50 satellite galaxies so far identified, concerns have been raised about science's understanding of dark matter, a mysterious substance which comprises about 85% of all the matter in the universe, but only interacts gravitationally with ordinary matter, making its detection and study extremely difficult. Worse still, scientists still don't know what dark matter is. In fact, they only know it exists because of its gravitational influence on ordinary matter. About 40 of those 50 known satellite galaxies orbiting the Milky Way are faint and diffuse, belonging to a category of so-called dwarf spheroidal galaxies. The newly discovered satellite galaxy named Virgo 1 is about 280,000 light-years away, in the direction of the constellation Virgo. At an absolute magnitude of minus 0.8 in the optical waveband, it may well be the faintest satellite galaxy ever detected. Many recently discovered dwarf galaxies, especially those seen in systematic photometric surveys, such as the Sloan Digital Sky Survey and the Dark Energy Survey, are very faint, with absolute luminosities in the optical waveband below minus 8 magnitude. These are so-called ultra-faint dwarf galaxies. However, previous searches for these galaxies used relatively small telescopes with diameters of 2.5 to 4 metres, so only relatively nearby satellite galaxies with higher magnitudes could be identified. Those that are more distant or fainter ones in the halo of the Milky Way are yet to be detected. This new Virgo 1 discovery was made using the 8.2 metre Subaru telescope in Hawaii as part of the Subaru Strategic Survey. The survey is unique because it combines a large telescope with a wide field capability, allowing astronomers to detect very faint dwarf galaxies over large areas of the sky. The first step in searching for a new dwarf galaxy involves identifying an overdensity of stars in the sky using photometric data. Then astronomers need to ensure that the overdense appearance isn't due to a line of sight or accidental juxtaposition of unrelated dense fields. In other words, they need to make sure that it really is a separate stellar grouping. The standard method for doing this is to look for a characteristic distribution of stars in the colour magnitude diagram. Stars in a general field should show no particular patterns in this diagram. Instead, the authors of this study did find an apparent overdensity of stars which had the characteristic pattern of an ancient stellar system in the colour magnitude diagram. The Virgo 1 galaxy has a radius of 124 light years, making it significantly larger than a globular cluster of similar luminosity. 
The faintest satellite dwarf galaxies previously identified included CGU-1, which was discovered by the Sloan Digital Sky Survey at a magnitude of minus 1.5, and Cetus-2, which was detected using the Dark Energy Survey at a magnitude of 0.0. However, Cetus-2 is yet to be confirmed because it appears to be too compact to be a galaxy and may instead end up being a stellar cluster. The discovery of Virgo-1 may have profound implications. Of course, first of all, it implies that there are hundreds of other faint dwarf galaxies just waiting to be discovered in the halo of the Milky Way. Just how many satellite galaxies are there and the properties they have will give astronomers a better understanding of how the Milky Way formed and how dark matter contributed towards its formation. For the cold dark matter hypothesis to be correct, there need to be hundreds of satellite galaxies orbiting the Milky Way. Of course, the problem there is so far only tens of satellite galaxies have been identified. And because this falls well short of the theoretically predicted number, it forms what's known as the missing satellite problem. Astronomers may need to consider types of dark matter other than cold dark matter. Alternatively, they may need to invoke baryonic physics to suppress galaxy formation in order to explain the shortfall in satellite numbers. Another possibility is that they've only seen a fraction of all the satellite galaxies associated with the Milky Way simply due to various observational biases. Only time will tell which answer is correct. Scientists behind an idea that the speed of light's variable and not a constant as Albert Einstein's relativity theory suggests have finally made a prediction that can be tested. The speed of light is 300,000 kilometres per second in a vacuum. It's the ultimate speed limit of the universe. In fact, the only thing faster is the expansion of the universe itself. And while photons can be slowed down as they travel through different mediums, such as the refraction of light in water, the speed of light in a vacuum remains one of science's great constants, a key foundation stone underpinning modern physics and science's understanding of the universe. Because Einstein observed that the speed of light remains the same in any situation, the implication is that space and time can be changed in different situations, and there have been many tests carried out which have supported this theory. One of the reasons a constant speed of light is important is because it plays a key role in models of what happened in the very early universe, seconds after the Big Bang. However, some researchers have suggested that the speed of light could have been much higher in the early universe. That's a claim which, if correct, would have major implications for science's understanding of cosmology. Now, the researchers behind this idea think they've finally developed a way to test it. You see, structures in the universe, for example galaxies, all formed from tiny fluctuations in density in the early cosmos. A record of these early fluctuations in the form of a spectral index is imprinted on the cosmic microwave background, the relic thermal radiation left over from the Big Bang, dating back to just 380,000 years after the birth of the cosmos 13.8 billion years ago. The researchers behind this idea hypothesized that these early fluctuations in density were influenced by a varying speed of light in the early universe. Now they've developed a model to put an exact figure on this spectral index. Reporting in the journal Physical Review, the researchers claim the spectral index is 0.96478. Now, this is close to the current estimates of readings of the cosmic microwave background, which puts it around 0.968. And as cosmologists get ever more precise readings for this figure, that prediction could soon be tested, either confirming or ruling out the team's model for the early universe. If future observations of this number prove to be accurate, it could well lead to a modification of Einstein's theory of general relativity. If true, it also means the laws of nature weren't always the same as they are today. The testability of the variable speed of light hypothesis sets it apart from the more mainstream rival hypothesis of cosmic inflation. Cosmic inflation claims in the nanoseconds after the universe formed, it went through an extremely rapid expansion phase, much faster than its current rate of expansion. The cosmic inflation hypothesis is needed in order to overcome what physicists have called the horizon problem. You see, the universe we see today appears to be broadly the same everywhere, no matter which direction you look in. For example, it has a relatively homogeneous density. Now, this can only be true if all regions of the universe are able to influence each other. However, if the speed of light has always been the same, 300,000 kilometers per second in a vacuum, then there simply hasn't been enough time since the universe's creation for light to have traveled from one side of the universe to the other to even out the energy. 
It's a bit like heating up a room evenly. Warm air from heaters at either end of the room need to travel across the room in order to mix fully. The problem for the universe is that the room, the observable size of the universe, appears to be simply too large for this to have happened in the 13.8 billion years since the universe was formed. The varying speed of light hypothesis suggests that the speed of light was much higher in the early universe, allowing the distant edges to be connected as the universe expanded. The speed of light would then have dropped in a predictable way as the density of the universe changed. And it's this variability which has led the authors to their prediction. The alternative hypothesis, cosmic inflation, attempts to solve this problem by saying that the very early universe evened out while it was still incredibly small. And then it suddenly expanded, due to something called cosmic inflation, with the uniformity already imprinted upon it. While this means that the speed of light and the other laws of physics as we know them are preserved, it still requires the invention of an inflationary field, a set of conditions that would only have existed in the first nanoseconds after creation. Time now to turn our eyes to the skies with December Skywatch. One of the astronomical highlights of December are the annual Geminids meteor shower, which usually peak around December the 13th and 14th. Radiating out from the direction of the constellation Gemini, the Geminids are unusual in that they're not generated by a comet as most other meteor showers are, but instead are produced by the debris trail left behind by the asteroid 3200 Python. This makes the Geminids, together with the Quadrantids, the only major meteor showers not originating from comets. The asteroid 3200 Python is highly unusual. Its high orbital eccentricity more closely resembles that of a comet than an asteroid. Python's orbit crosses all the inner terrestrial planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth and Mars. In fact, next year, Python will come within 10,312,000 kilometres of Earth. And while that's pretty close by astronomical standards, it's nothing compared to the close approach to Earth it will have on December the 14th, 2093, when it will pass just 2,960,000 kilometres from Earth. 3200 Python's also unusual in that it approaches the Sun closer than any other named asteroid, with a perihelion of less than 21 million kilometres, less than half of the perihelion distance of Mercury, the closest planet to the Sun. Coming so close to the Sun causes Pathion's surface temperature to reach over 750 degrees Celsius. In fact, recent studies by NASA's Stereo spacecraft observed dust trails radiating off the asteroid surface. And in 2010, Pathion was detected ejecting dust. Scientists think the intense heat generated by its close approaches to the Sun causes fractures in gravel and rocks on the asteroid surface, similar to mud cracks in a dry lake bed. Pathion's composition also fits the notion of a cometary origin. It's classified as a B-type asteroid because it's composed of dark material. B-type asteroids are thought to be primitive, volatile, rich remnants of the early solar system. If that's the case, Pathion may well be what happens to a comet when it loses most of its volatiles. It becomes an asteroid. In fact, its composition, orbit and dust trail have led astronomers to refer to 3200 Pathion as a rock comet. And that's intrinsic to the sort of meteors we get from the Geminids. Geminids meteors tend to have a yellowish hue, and they tend to be a bit larger and more solid than typical meteors from comets. They also move more slowly, travelling at around 35 km per second on average. That compares to some cometary meteor showers which can reach speeds of 72 km per second. Interestingly, the Geminids are also thought to be intensifying every year, with recent showers seeing up to 160 meteors per hour under optimal conditions. Well north of the equator, the radiant for the Geminids rises at about sunset, reaching a usable elevation from the local early evening onwards. However, here in the southern hemisphere, the radiant only appears around midnight. Another highlight for the month is the December solstice. This year it will occur at 21.44 Australian Eastern Daylight Time on Wednesday, December the 21st, as the sun reaches zenith, appearing to be directly over the Tropic of Capricorn. Of course, in the Northern Hemisphere, it's the winter solstice marking the first day of winter. But the good news is that from now on, the days start to get longer again. South of the equator, summer has well and truly arrived, and the days now start to get shorter. On the day of the December solstice, Earth's south pole will be tilted towards the sun. The sun rises south of east and sets south of west, reaching 28.5 degrees above the horizon at noon. Our seasons are governed by the tilt of Earth's axis as it journeys around the Sun each year. So when the south pole of the Earth is tilted towards the Sun, it's the southern hemisphere summer. 
Six months later, when the South Pole is tilted away from the sun, it's the Southern Hemisphere winter. In between these, we have the autumn and spring equinox. Now, the solstices and equinoxes are only associated with Earth's axial tilt in relation to the Sun. They have nothing to do with Earth's orbital position in relation to the Sun. Earth's closest orbital position to the Sun, perihelion, occurs about two weeks after the December solstice. And it's furthest from the Sun at aphelion about two weeks after the June solstice. Temperatures on Earth aren't determined so much by Earth's orbital distance from the Sun as they are by the angle of the Sun's ray striking the Earth, which is where the axial tilt comes in. In summer, the Sun is high in the sky and the rays hit the Earth at a steep angle. In winter, the Sun is lower in the sky and so the rays strike the Earth at a more shallow angle. Interestingly, in most parts of the world, the seasons begin on the day of the solstice or equinox. However, Australia is a bit weird in that regard. Its seasons begin on the first day of a particular calendar month. The 1st of March for autumn, the 1st of June for winter, the 1st of September for spring, and you guessed it, the 1st day of December for summer. The last day of this year could be a good time to catch Comet 45P Honda. It's a short period comet expected to reach its closest position to Earth on February 11, 2017, when it will be just under 12 million kilometres away. First discovered back in 1948, Comet 45P has a nucleus diameter of between 0.5 and 1.6 kilometres. Last month it was seen to rapidly brighten, providing a great target for sky watchers in the Southern Hemisphere as it heads towards next year's closest approach to Earth. Northern sky observers may get a chance to glimpse the comet at the very end of the year as it approaches perihelion. 45P is predicted to reach magnitude 7 based on its last visit to the inner solar system in 2011 when it reached an apparent magnitude of 21 on June the 5th. The comet's on an elliptical orbit with a period of 5.25 years. However, its close encounters with Jupiter have in the past made some noticeable changes to its orbit. And now, with the rest of the December night skies, we're joined by Jonathan Nally, editor of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine. For us down here in the Southern Hemisphere, of course, summer times, good stargazing weather, you know, you don't have to get rugged up too much to go outside and have a look at the stars and the planets, so it's a pretty good time of year, particularly because around this time of year, the constellation Orion is up and about. Everyone loves Orion. If you're in the Northern Hemisphere, unfortunately, it's winter time when you can see Orion, so you do have to rug up, but fortunately for us down here in the south, it's a summertime constellation. So Orion, out to the east, in the eastern part of the sky, after sunset when the sky gets dark you see Orion there you can't miss it it's the one that's got the three stars in a row right through the middle of it there's a bright blue star up above that's called Rigel that's part of Orion as well and one down below is bright red star called Betelgeuse famous Betelgeuse that sort of encompasses most of Orion and as we've spoken about in the show before sort of going off perpendicular from that little row of three stars there's a couple of other smaller fainter stars the middle of which looks a bit blurry if you can get a telescope onto it you'll see it's actually the Orion Nebula which is pretty specky an amazing star forming region yeah, it's 1,500 light years away. And even if you don't get a pretty ordinary view of it, just think of what you're seeing. You're seeing something that's 1,500 light years away. There's an enormous cloud of gas and dust where new stars are being born. So that's pretty amazing. Towards the right or down towards the south of Orion, you'll see a really bright star. That's Sirius. That's the brightest star in the sky. And it's in the constellation of Canis Major, the larger dog or the greater dog. Around to the left or west of Orion is the constellation Taurus with its brightest star, Aldebaran. Get a pair of binoculars onto this region if you can because there are lots of nice star clusters and star groupings around this. You'll see just near Aldebaran there's sort of a triangle group of stars. Have a look in around there because it's really quite lovely. In the northern part of our sky, looking north, pretty dim this time of year. Some large dim constellations including Pisces the fish and just above Pisces the fish you've got Cetus the whale. So lots of nautical stuff happening up there. Further around in the west, after sunset, well this is where some of the action is taking place because Venus and Mars are out there shining nice and brightly. Venus is the brighter one of the two of course. Really nice and big and bright and Mars Mars is sort of up and above to its right and a bit dimmer and sort of an orangey-reddish sort of colour. So Venus and Mars are all right tonight, as Wings would say. Oh, uh, we're showing our age, mate. Showing our age. So one or two listeners out there might remember Wings, but uh, they were good. I like them. We still have their albums. Oh, they, they, got, they had some great songs. Uh, and it's really interesting, just going off on a tangent, how McCartney, after finished with the Beatles, he wanted to start from scratch with Wings. And, you know, they just put themselves in the back of a van and travelled around to pubs and places and really started again from scratch as a travelling band. And, uh, they didn't didn't sort of trade on his band uh, on the run, yeah. fame too much. Anyway, so Venus and Mars are out there, and as the month goes on, those two planets will draw closer together. In
in the sky too, by the way. Venus and Mars will just get closer and closer and closer. They won't get, you know, right up next to each other, but they will get closer and closer. So if you can get outside each night, or every couple of nights or something, and have a look, you'll see that their positions will change. And that's because they're going around the sun and we're going around the sun and all the angles are changing a little bit. So even though they're a long way apart in space, a really long way apart in space, because of our line of sight effect, they will seem to be coming closer and closer together. Of course, this month, for the third month in a row, we have well, what some people like to call a supermoon, that is a, a perigee full moon. It won't be as close as the one we had last month, but uh, it, it's still a perigee full moon. Yeah, look, I've, I've purposely stayed away from all this super, super duper moon. moon stuff. <laughs> super moons that have been going on these last couple of months particularly uh, in November because um, oh, I reckon it's all a beat up you know the change in size is just only, only tiny if no one had mentioned anything about it no one would have known any difference you wouldn't have, got, wouldn't have gone out and said oh look the moon is unusually big and bright tonight it wasn't like that last month you just wouldn't even know so look it's a great opportunity to get people outside having a look at the moon don't begrudge them that anything that helps promote astronomy can't be too bad can't be too bad but it's uh, it is a bit of a beat up we have to admit indeed especially when you consider its origins in astrology all things. How dare you mention that word? How unscientific. Goodness gracious me, wash your mouth out. I don't know why I've even talking to you mentioning that word. People in the olden days, so to speak, astrology was uh, what it was all about. Astronomy developed from that to a large extent. Yeah, well, that, that's back when people knew no better, you know, and they were trying to make sense of what was going up and uh, happening up there in the sky. Uh, and they had to be magic. Gods in the sky and all that sort of stuff and magic and goodness knows what and you now the earth is flat and all that kind of thing. But uh, fortunately, we've moved on a little bit since then. All right. So we've covered the sort of eastern part of the sky after sunset in the northern part and the western and the western half of the sky. So now down south. So after sunsets, when the sky just gets dark and everything, if you're looking for the Southern Cross, well, you won't be able to find it probably because it's upside down and right down on the horizon. In fact, for people in the northern half of Australia, you won't even see it. It'll be below your horizon. So that's just sort of in the early part of the evening when it gets dark. But as the Earth rotates, the Southern Cross will appear to sort of swing upwards from the south and sort of move upwards into the southeastern part of the sky. So if you're up in about, you know, the wee hours of the morning, you should be able to see it up there nice and big and bright, you know, up there with its, its two stellar mates, the two pointers, Alpha and Beta Centauri. If you're out and about or you're an early early riser or a night owl you're on shift work and you go out to have a cup of coffee outside or something get out and have a look and down the south and southeast you should be able to see the southern cross and by this stage of the morning too at this time of year the milky way is riding nice and high up in the sky sort of crisscrossing the sky from southeast to northwest if you have dark skies or you can get to somewhere where there are dark skies get some binoculars onto the milky way and just be amazed by all the stars and the star clusters and the nebulae and stuff it's just a most beautiful part of the sky just looking into our galaxy and and just you look there and you see so many stars and, and there are more that you can't see you know unless you have bigger telescopes and things it's just quite a stunning view now if you're up really early in the morning having a look at that if you're around you know a couple of hours before dawn or something make sure you get out and spot jupiter which is rising in the east where the sun comes up but before the sun comes up about two or three hours before dawn depending on what time of the month we're at during december and again if you're having trouble figuring out which one's jupiter and you shouldn't be because it's the brightest thing out there in the eastern sky before dawn the moon will be right next to it two days before Christmas, December 23rd, and I mean right next to it. So we'll probably get lots of UFO reports. You know, what's those, those lights in the sky out there? It happens all the time, but people <laughs> don't know this. Usually it's something like Venus, which does that, isn't it? People look at Venus and they go, oh, that thing's moving. And it's not, of course, but they think it is. And we usually wind up getting lots of UFO reports about Venus. Jupiter does it as well, hey? Oh, that's right. Jupiter, uh, um, see, Jupiter can be around in the morning sky. It can be in the evening sky, uh, high up in the, in, in the above us in the evening sky. It can be sort of anywhere during the course of the year. Whereas Venus hangs around either the western sky after sunset or it hangs around in the eastern sky before dawn and yeah people uh, sort of we all go about our daily work you know looking down at the ground or looking at our feet or looking at our computers or whatever and you look up every now and then you think, what on earth is that big bright light that wasn't there last night or the night before or the night before it must be a ufo the fact is of course it was there the night before you just didn't notice it either because you weren't looking or there was a cloud in the way or buildings or whatever or you, you weren't outside so um but anyway look go outside and have a look it's the most magnificent thing and the thing is don't just don't just think oh it's a nice bright light in the sky that's a planet it's an actual planet venus is you know about the same size as earth and it's millions of kilometers away and you're looking at the thing and you can see it and jupiter you know many many times the size of the earth and hundreds of millions of kilometers away and there's a nasa spacecraft circling around juno jupiter yes. right now juno yeah and he got there a few months ago so when you're looking at that thing the light coming into your eye from jupiter left there many many minutes ago and there's a spacecraft out there circling around and the nasa tracking station outside of canberra and the other ones around the world are keeping an eye on it and sending signals back 
back and forth. The universe out there is real. It's, it's real stuff. And we, we tend to lose sight of this, uh, no pun intended, because we live in such light polluted skies. We don't really get a good sense of the universe above us anymore. And, you know, we're all busy. Uh, and, and you go outside and you see one or two stars. But, you know, it's not like being in a dark country skies where some fortunate people live, where you do get this connection still to the universe above and all, all around us, not just above us, all around us. We're just this, these little animals stuck on this, gravitationally stuck on this ball of rock going through space. And it's, it's amazing, amazing stuff out there. So enjoy it as much as you can, whether it's just with the naked eye or if you've got a pair of binoculars or you've got a telescope or know someone who does and you get a chance to look through it every now and then, uh, make the most of it because it's fabulous. And of course, the thing about Jupiter is that Jupiter is really important in astronomy because it was thanks to Galileo's observations of Jupiter that we realized that we don't live in an Earth-centric universe. There are other bodies out there. In this case, it was Jupiter. It had its own little mini solar system of celestial bodies orbiting it, the four Galilean moons, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. And it was all because of Galileo turning a uh, what was actually a Dutch invention of a telescope. Instead of looking over the horizon to see what ships were heading for the port, he pointed it up in the sky and he studied the stars. And as a result of that, we're pretty comfortable now in our knowledge that the universe doesn't revolve around the Earth. Of course, he wasn't the first person to come up with that idea. No, he wasn't the first, but, but he, he came up with evidence for it. So Copernicus, some years before uh, Galileo, in fact, Copernicus died about uh, 20 years before Galileo was born. So, you know, they're, they're a fair distance apart. But uh, Copernicus had suggested and worked out scientific reasoning for why the sun was the center of our solar system or the universe, as they would have thought the whole thing was at the time. But it was Galileo when he came along. And as you say, he used this uh, new telescope and he saw the moons going around Jupiter, which showed that things went around other things, not just the Earth. And the three the two of them and I suppose you'd say they really kicked off the scientific revolution the scientific method you know coming up with an idea and testing it not just accepting that it's true or it's false or something but actually putting it to test uh, working out hypotheses and tests you can do and seeing whether you're right or not seems like common sense doesn't it but in ages where things were just controlled by dogma and you must believe this and you must not question this was a pretty revolutionary sort of thing unfortunately of course there's still a lot of that goes on in this day and age which is rather disappointing and of course the other thing Galileo did you're also mentioning Venus the other thing Galileo did was he saw the phases of Venus as it orbited the sun. That's right, yeah. So Venus shows, you don't, you don't see it with the naked eye. Venus just looks like a bright star. But if you get a telescope onto it, then Venus shows phases like our moon does, at crescents and not quite full and all that sort of thing. If you work it out mathematically, if you've got the sun in the middle of the solar system and you've got Venus going around on the inside and you've got us going around outside of it, then the only possible way you can see phases of Venus is if it is going around the sun and we're going around the sun and it's interior to us it's closer to the sun than we are there is no other way it can possibly work but of course you know before telescopes came along people didn't see the phases of venus that wasn't a supporting argument prior to telescopes but essentially it took until galileo turned the telescope onto venus and had a look it was actually a kid's toy for many years yeah that's jonathan nally the editor of australian sky and telescope magazine And that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, and from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com. The show is also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C. This is Space Time with Stuart Gary. For more, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Tumblr. Just search for Space Time with Stuart Gary.